recent nonpartisan public survey of Americans favoring change in U.S. policy towards Cuba and the upcoming 2015 Summit of the Americas draw attention to the need to re-examine relations between the U.S. and Cuba and the relevance of 50 years of embargo. You go to Cuba, it looks like time stood still. Nothing changed. The same thing, people, the same thing that I heard when I left the island 35 years ago. The sanctions have been partially successful. They have deprived Cuba of obtaining loans and credits in the United States. Uh, the embargo clearly has not achieved anything. We need to talk about its impact in the economy. They don't want to see their country or their society like Haiti or like Mexico or the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico. In this episode of In Focus, we're here in Miami, Florida, home to over one million Cuban Americans. We're here to find out whether the sanctions on Cuba have been effective or whether they're just another outdated relic of the Cold War. Following Fidel Castro's victory against the Batista regime in 1959, the U.S. government placed an embargo on Cuba, depriving the country of economic opportunities. In 2001, the Bush administration called for an expansion of embargo enforcement, including tightening a travel embargo to the island, cracking down on illegal cash transfers, and conducting a more robust information campaign aimed at Cuba. However, in 2011, President Obama made his first efforts to loosen these sanctions by lessening travel restrictions and allowing Cuban Americans to send their relatives remittances. But critics still question the effectiveness and the outcome of 50 years of sanctions. Many Cubans living in Miami struggle to answer the question of whether the sanctions on Cuba have been effective. We are going to talk to Yvette Barroso and her family, all of whom reside here in Miami and have strong ties back in Cuba to see how they feel about the situation. Where are we going? I'm going to take you guys to my dad's gallery. Uh, he's an uh, artist and a sculptor and uh, he's amazing. And probably my two cousins are going to be there, Lynette and Laura. They're like, uh, they just came from Cuba like two years ago. All right, fantastic. It's so like a creative melting pot that we're about sure, to walk yeah. into right now. Definitely. Yvette's father, Ivan Del Valle, was a former Cuban army officer who moved to the U.S. in the 70s as part of a political prisoner exchange. Now, you have a tremendously compelling personal story. You've attempted to escape from Cuba back in the 70s. Tell us a little bit about that. What was it like that night when you tried to escape Cuba? I was in the army and the situation was getting worse in Cuba because they, uh, my daughter was nine months old. And that particular time, they got a law that they took away the milk from the ration card we had, and they took away the milk and the meat from her. There were no more milk for kids. So I got no, nothing to bring to the table. Somebody offered me, let's go kill a, a cow. I said, I don't do that. I don't kill cows to bring, they're gonna sentence you to 20 years to kill a cow, and I don't kill animals. I don't, I don't believe in killing animals. So I decided I'd take people out of the queue. All of a sudden I said, this is the time to get out of here right now. What was the plan? The plan was to hijack a plane. Actually, it was to fly the plane from Guantanamo to Guantanamo, Cuba, to Guantanamo, United States. It's a five minutes flight right there. It was a perfect, that's the pilot who was doing that for 17 years. For some reason, they, the Cuban uh, uh, intelligence service acquire information of the plan, and they put everybody in prison. They sentenced 20 years and 12 years and 30 years. And your daughter was how old when you were released? I was nine. Yeah, I went to school. She promised, she asked me one time in prison, Daddy, when you're free, can you come and pick me up at school? So recently there's been an ease in travel restrictions on Cuba. How has that affected you? Still, you need to get a visa, even though you're Cuban which is absurd, totally. I don't understand that, because I'm Cuban, so. But anyways, it's, it's open, we can go. Ivan, are the sanctions working? Are the Cuban people suffering because of the sanctions? The, the sanctions are not working at all, 50 years plus, and you see no change in the Cuban people, no, nothing happened. The, the elite 
and the government still got access to anything they want through all the partners in, in com European uh, countries. So they got access to everything they need. Mm -hmm. I think it's not working economically, uh, politically, morally, and I pro right now for lifting an embargo and let the people flood, the Cuban people be flood with food, information for anywhere. What to Cuba, it looks like time stood still. Nothing changed. The same two people, the same thing that I heard when I left the island 35 years ago. It's like time don't happen over there. Now, so what is your, what would be your message to the Cuban Americans that believe in keeping the sanctions? What, what's your, what's generally your message? I, I know the message is you have to see the, and know the tree by his fruits. The fruits of the embargo brought nothing but misery to the Cuban people. So I know it's controversial, but the only way to get something done right now is talking and doing something, because we're doing nothing for 50 plus years. What's your message to President Obama? It's the same. Let the people of Cuba have the power to decide what they wanted to do. Teresa Gutierrez is the National Director of the International Action Center for Latin America and Caribbean Projects. She frequently visits Cuba to meet with union and community leaders and to conduct educational and cultural research. She gave us some insight into what Cubans on the island may think. The sanctions have not worked because the Cuban government, the Cuban people year after year after year expressed their support for the Cuban government. They don't want to see their country or their society like Haiti or like Mexico or the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico. And this is one of the reasons why the blockade and other forms of aggression that the U.S. has carried out for over 50 years has not succeeded. Uh, so politically, the sanctions, the blockade, the other acts of aggression have not worked against Cuba, but economically they have brought hardship. And that's why the United Nations and other uh, entities have condemned the, the blockade and have called for its removal. Our next stop was in Wynwood, Miami. It was formerly an industrial neighborhood, but it is now home to many art galleries and murals, and widely known as one of the largest open-air street art exhibitions in the world. We went there to speak with Ricardo Herrera of the Cuba Study Group. He's responsible for managing the group's projects and activities in South Florida. We asked him about his organization's work and discussed the embargo. Have the sanctions against Cuba worked? The sanctions against Cuba have not worked. They've been in place uh, for over 50 years through 11 presidents and they have nothing to show for. The effect that the sanctions are having now is causing injury to Cuban civil society, the strengthening of Cuban civil society. They already have it hard enough in the island. Our sanctions are making it hard for them to really become the authors of their own future. Ricardo's sentiments are shared by Dr. Ariel Armini. He's the director of the University of Miami's Center for Latin American Studies. He has published extensively about democratization, civil society, and human rights in Latin America. I mean, we really need to talk about facts, and we need to talk about the fact that uh, the embargo clearly has not achieved anything. We need to talk about its impact in the economy. Look at uh, the case of Brazil. Brazil is investing millions of dollars in Cuba. So what kind of impact uh, is the embargo having on the Cuban economy? However, not everyone agrees with that perspective. While we were on campus at the University of Miami, we visited Jaime Sushliki, the director of the Institute for Cuban and Cuban American Studies. His recent op-ed piece in the New York Times supporting the embargo caused controversy within the Cuban American community. As a professor of history specializing in U.S. relations with Latin America, he has published several books on Cuba and the revolution. The sanctions have been partially successful. They have deprived Cuba of obtaining loans and credits in the United States, have deprived Cuba of American tourism. But the sanctions that in President Kennedy introduced in 1961 were not intended to overthrow the Cuban regime, were intended to punish the Cuban regime for confiscating American properties in Cuba and for not paying for them. So uh, this is, hasn't been a consistent policy to try to overthrow the regime in Cuba or to make changes. At times, there have been some U.S. administrations that have done certain things to overthrow the Castro regime, but since the 19... 70s or 
mid-70s, I think that policy ended and there's been only the embargo left as the symbol of American displeasure on happiness. Let me explain a couple of things. Uh, first, let's put Florida uh, in the context of the United States. A, a recent survey that um, asks about people's support for the embargo um, shows that in Florida, more people think that the embargo should term, should end uh, than in general in the United States, which is very interesting. Second, the Cuban-American community here has changed a lot in the last few decades, particularly because the new generation of Cuban-Americans have a completely different perspective on Cuba. They understand that the best way to engage with the island is to uh, to, um, to cooperate, to talk about common issues. And so they are very different from the older generation, which many of them are, of course, you know, very bitter about the regime. Also within the Cuban community, there are different political groups. And we have heard recently about very important Cuban-American business people who have stated that they are ready to engage in business in Cuba and they don't need to wait for a regime change to do that. So what we have is a much more mixed picture in terms of what the Cuban community is. Look, the one thing statement you can generalize about the Cuban-American community is that they all would like to see a change. They would like to see a democratic Cuba. They would like to see a prosperous Cuba. That I can tell you 98% of the Cubans in, in the United States feel that, that way. Now, there are some that feel that the embargo should be modified. Some of them feel that there should be more travel. Uh, some of them feel that the policy should be tightened. So there is a variety of points of view in the Cuban American. It's a pluralistic community. I think that Cuban Americans uh, have just never resolved themselves to the fact that uh, when the revolution was was occurring, they really thought it would be over in a few days and they would come back and things would be just the way they were. They didn't expect this overall sweeping changes in the Cuban society. Uh, they have never resolved themselves to the victory of the Cuban revolution. Uh, since then, you know, the children of these Cubans have softened their approach. And so Cuban Americans uh, need to respect the will of the Cuban people who manifest their support of the Cuban government and manifest their support for the Cuban way of life. Ivan Galindo is a Cuban sculptor and a recognized member of the Miami art scene. His public works include sculptures and religious icons scattered throughout churches in the U.S. Ivan grew up in Cuba and had first-hand experience under the sanctions. He has strong ties with the Cuban Americans in the Miami community. We wanted to get his perspective on the issue. So tell us, what was life like in Cuba under the sanctions? Es una vida como todos los cubanos con decadencia, con toda la la, la dificultad que tiene un cubano normal. Hay un bloqueo, pero hay un bloqueo más intenso en Cuba contra el propio cubano. Mm -hmm. eh, yo creo que es necesario que ya el gobierno americano se siente a sentar a negociar de la forma que se quiera decir negociar o exigir o tratar de hacer un ajuste porque ya el cubano necesita la oportunidad que tiene el mundo entero. Llevamos 50 años con una, una estrategia de tratar de, de bloquear nosotros mismos que los americanos no le puedan entrar a la Cuba. Pero la mejor manera de penetrarle a ese sistema y lograr de que el sistema acabe es eh, negociando. Es la única manera, estando dentro de Cuba, y lo mismo lo pueden hacer los americanos que lo pueden hacer los europeos. Pero con, el, con la posibilidad de que el cubano de a pie tenga las oportunidades como la tiene todo el mundo. Como lo tiene. So this is a beautiful sculpture. Why don't you tell us what you and your team are doing here? Mis amigos Kiko Reyes de Lalo que son una compañía que tienen una fábrica de, de, de hacer el trabajo de construcción metálica, entonces yo les planteé en un, un momento determinado, les dije, mira, tengo esta idea, y ellos se me brindaron con mucho gusto, y gracias a ellos y a, y a la habilidad que tengo de poder hacer ciertas esculturas, hemos creado a Celia Cruz, haciendo un homenaje a la guarachera del mundo, pues no quiero decir la guarachera de Cuba, porque ella representó eh, al mundo entero latino, ella llevó a, la, a todos los lugares, a todos los rincones de la tierra, llevó lo, el arte de ella. When Cuban Americans first travel to Cuba, the response is almost always, I was very happy that I got to go and see the Cuban reality with my own eyes. It's almost always, I saw that our policy is doing nothing to help the average Cuban in the island improve their lives. And it's almost always, I would encourage my friends to go visit 
Cuba and see that reality with their own eyes. I myself have traveled to Cuba about 15 times, and I've talked to a number of people on the street, at conferences, in unions, you know, in the community. And, you know, Cuba's not a perfect place. You know, the Cuban people themselves tell you that we are not the hell that our enemies describe, but we're not the paradise that our friends describe either. In Cuba, anyone can walk into a hospital and get free health care. Anyone can go to school free. Anyone can attend college. The Cuban people are clear that the Cuban government, the Cuban revolution has opened up a new day for Cuba and the Cuban people will not return to what happened to how things were before 1959. Many Latin American nations announced that they will not attend the 2015 Summit of the Americas without Cuba and that the U.S. embargo will be the subject of contention. Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Nicaragua will all boycott the event if Cuba is not included. I asked our experts about the status of Cuba amongst the Latin American countries. Latin America is for the most part united in the sense that they support Cuba. And several countries are, are critical of the human rights situation, but they are overall support Cuba and they are clearly against the embargo. And this is an element that separates, that divides the United States from Latin America. Cuba in Latin America has to do in part the support that Cuba provided with many of the leaders in the past. Some of these were guerrilla leaders like Ortega and others. So Cuba and from Nicaragua. So Cuba has been supporting these people. Also helped them come to power when they shift their policy from gaining power through violence to gaining power through the ballot. So uh, when these candidates became uh, political animals, Cuba sent their supporters, sent their money, and helped them achieve power. What is happening in Bolivia, in Venezuela, in Ecuador, and elsewhere follows the model of Cuba and not the model of the U.S. government. And this threatens U.S. foreign policy, a foreign policy that has been proven over and over again that is uh, full of intervention, whether it's in Nicaragua, whether it's in Chile in 73, whether it's in Guatemala. Uh, the U.S. government has funded agencies and organizations that have not brought any good to the people of Latin America. And so now Latin America has decided no longer to have these kinds of, of atrocities happen in their backyard, in their nations. And they've decided to stand up. And uh, there's a regrouping and a realliance in Latin America that the Cuban Revolution is at the heart of. This is why the U.S. government is so entrenched against Cuba. If the United States, as Secretary Kerry was saying last year, really believes, for example, that the end of the, Mon the Monroe Doctrine has ended, so the United States can do something very important in improving its relationship with the region, and that is to end the embargo. Considering the recent public survey of Americans favoring change in U.S. policy towards Cuba, we asked our experts what Cuban Americans can do to influence policymakers, and if they're optimistic about the future of U.S.-Cuba relations. People think that the, a very small sector of the Cuban community, Cuban American community, still has, I don't know, some power and some influence to, um, you know, maintain the situation. In fact, the situation has changed and now there is wide support for a change in the policy. So I think that um, Congress people should not be afraid of changing the, their position. I think that the government uh, has a lot to gain because there is support for a change in the policy and the numbers in these surveys are telling us that. Well, the only change that counts is the electoral change and the Cuban Americans in Miami for the past 10-15 years have supported uh, Mario diaz Ballard, Ileana Ross, uh, Senator Marcos Rubio. So as long as they're voting for these Congress people that support the embargo, I don't think there is a real change. The day they vote out Ileana, Mario, and Marco Rubio, then I will begin to believe that there is a change in Miami.
Well, it's important to remember that uh, U.S. policy towards Cuba has been the same under both the Democratic and a Republican administration, whether it's a Ronald Reagan or a George Bush or a John Kennedy or a, or a Barack Obama. The policy has remained the same. And so we've got to tell the people of this country that the United States spends millions of money on radio and TV Martí to undermine uh, the Cuban Revolution. Why don't you ask that that money be spent for the poor of, of Mississippi? You know, they don't have education, they don't have health care. So the Cuban-American, uh, if they started thinking correctly, in my opinion, would use their influence in Washington to lift the blockade of Cuba, because the Cuban people have spoken and defended their way of life over and over. Lynette and Laura Garcia, Yvette's cousins, recently moved from Cuba to Miami. Do you want to normalize relations between the United States and Cuba? Of course. That would be awesome. And it would be great that people will have the same opportunities that we have in here. I would even go there to live, actually. I would say that, that we, we should. We, we need to. They need to be connected and they because we we both have family there. I, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that have family there. After we came back from Miami to New York, we wanted to talk to Jason Marzak of the Atlantic Council, which had conducted the recent survey. Jason summarized the findings for us. Friends are really interested. So we, we, we found that 50%, 56% of, of Americans support normalizing or engaging more directly with Cuba. So they favor changing policy rather than keeping, keeping current policy. But I think the, the aha moment for us was not just the 56% of Americans that support changing policy, but the fact that that's even higher in Florida. So we always thought that Cuba policy was intractable, intractable because Florida was intractable. But we actually found 63% uh, support in Florida for changing Cuba policy. Um, and also some more support in, uh, among the Latino community. We've also at the same time seen inter internationally the fact that even though the U.S. Pol US tries to isolate Cuba, the Cuba is far from isolated internationally. The e EU recently launched uh, the, the beginning of talks on trade and investment with Cuba in the, be in the beginning of February. Cuba recently hosted Latin American presidents from around the region in early, late January. Uh, President Rousseff of Brazil was recently in Cuba to inaugurate a new port. And so we've seen this, this sea change. I think also with regard to the poll that, that we put out, the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arch Latin America Center, and so there, it's really generated this new awakening domestically and internationally that now could potentially be a moment for change. We've spoken to many people in the Cuban community in Miami who struggle with the weight of the embargo. It is now up to the United States to decide how it wants to address its policy towards Cuba. Despite public opinion and the many pleas from Cuban Americans to end the embargo, U.S. policy has remained largely unchanged. But the U.S. cannot continue to isolate Cuba unless it wants to isolate itself. <laughs>